Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. It's a road show Friday. Hail Bar City Radio at the Single Barrel. Here inside the Graduate, you want great steaks, you want amazing whiskey, and uh, you're in town for the game or thinking about doing so in the near future, we invite you down to the Single Barrel, our home, home football Fridays. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal on site, Connor Clark back at our ESPN studios, and we're presented by your friends at Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Numbers to get in today can join us ahead of Nebraska and Georgia Southern 466-3776-466-3776-800-825-5865. Somebody picked the unders last night. I'm in the best steakhouse in the world <laughs> oh, no. to collect that steak and a beer bet. Sent a text to Elijah Herbal last night, Connor. It's like, <laughs> just in capital letters, unders. And our old man Josh, Josh Allen uh, came through. Well, you talked me out of taking the Rams. You talked me out of the overs. And, brother, uh, I'm just going to listen to what you want, go the other way, and, and, and keep collecting t bones Big problem last night was is everything was in place. Turnovers? Everything was in, <laughs> everything was in place for the overs to hit. All the Rams had to do was punch in one of their, what, four takeaways? Like, you can't have four takeaways and only end up scoring 10 points in the game. You can't do it. Like, it, it's, it was a bad performance from the Rams last night, and that's how football goes. That's why I'm not a betting man is because things like this happen where everything's in place for the Rams. Short fields, they're getting takeaways for, uh, for the overs to hit, and that's all they had to do. But on the bright side, at least Josh Allen put up a, a big fantasy performance for me. On the other side, my opponent had Cooper Cup, so it's uh, kind of a wash. They both had big games. Uh, but, hey, I'll, I'll take – 34 points from Josh Allen in my fantasy league. That's that's a good start to the year for me. Will it be a good start for Nebraska football? That has been the trend out of the gate, quarter one, out of the third quarter, that middle part. Can it happen? It's been an interesting week, Elijah uh, and Connor. We'll start off with just kind of the, the accumulation of this locker room, the, the practice field, the opponent – and, you know, the, 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 the intensity that is a reality around this football program. Husker, all-time great. He's got an award named after him for the best center in football because he was. Uh, Dave Remington uh, will be with us here in about 15 minutes. We'll spend time with Bill Dolman on site, the pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports. The professor will sit down. He has better hair than the uh, late, great John Clayton. And uh, in hour two, Cedric Golden uh, will get his thoughts on Casey Thompson, his performance so far. Cedric covered Casey down at Texas. We'll also get Cedric's take on Bama rolling into do naughty things to Bevo, as in throw him (laughs) on the grill. But guys, Nebraska front and center, on our mind and do you think this team can come out and play dare i say loose i think they're inspired i think they want to do well not only for themselves but they really want to do well for their head football coach and their position coaches guys that have recruited them or guys that have maybe unlocked uh, some different football knowledge that are new coaches for them Uh, coach kaz nailed it and said they They were a tight football team uh, against Northwestern. They were a tight football team uh, against North Dakota last week. That's – it's oversimplified, guys, but to me that's real big. Can they come out, take a deep breath, just go do their job? Next week – listen, next week it's house money. You're the underdog. Next week is let it rip. This week can you just come out and – and manage can you shut out all the noise whether or not it's affected you it's had to have because of your performance and you can't play tight and to me it shouldn't be a battle of can nebraska go out and win this football game and i'm sure saying this right now is gonna is gonna bite me 
uh, later, but <laughs> it really should for this Husker football team. It should be come out, do your job, and see if you can cover the spread. Now, I'm sure there's no one in the locker room talking about the spread or what's going we on. We pray in not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what it should look like. Is it should be a team that if you can go out and you can do your job, I don't think a, a three-score win is entirely out of the question just based on how you out-athlete Georgia Southern. It's about going out there and showing that, yeah, something did change at halftime of that North Dakota game, and, and something clicked for this football team where you realized, you know what, it's all about ev- all 11 guys on the football field doing their job, doing their 111th of what needs to happen for a, a play to be successful. And can everyone, uh, especially on the defensive side, not try to do too much? And offensively, uh, it's that same thing. Can you do your job if you're uh, an offensive lineman? Can you clear a running lane against uh, a defensive line that really you should be able to open up running lanes against? As a wide receiver, can you go burn a cornerback on a route like you should the four-star former athlete uh, that went to Texas or LSU or wherever you went, can you go out and do that? And if Nebraska can do that, it, it should be somewhere in that 14 to 21, maybe 24-point victory for Nebraska. If you can just go out there and do your job. Connor, it, it sounds simple enough, right, doing your job. But it's been easier said than done. Nebraska's done their job. They've made some plays. They did so last week. They created a key momentum-shifting turnover, the strip sack by your leader, Garrett Nelson. Your Florida State import is as good as advertised, and, and Grant ripped off a run, and, and, and you found some footing. You, you ripped off 21 consecutive points, and, and you made it look like it needed to look like the final 14 minutes. But I think that, that, that freedom is, is very key. And uh, they've been a work in progress, but they, they just can't be scared. Yeah, they can't be scared. They have to play loose. But at the same time, I feel like there has to be some sort of sense of urgency in that first half as well mm-hmm. because this is a game where, as Elijah mentioned, this is a game where you should be able to cover that, that what, 23.5-point spread now. And this is just my personal opinion. I think this game needs to be pretty much not left in doubt at halftime. I think that Nebraska needs to come out loading on the offensive end. They need to come out firing and they need to really draw a line in the sand and say, okay, we know we can do this, and if they can do that, I think that the playing loose and the freedom will come as a result of that. But again, I think there's a little bit of a sense of urgency, especially in that first two quarters, for Nebraska to really come out, put, put, their, put their foot on their throat, draw that line in the sand, and, and say, hey, we're here, and, and we're not going to mess around anymore. Also, this is really like the first normal week of the year as well, if you if you don't want to count last week, which I think uh, the jet lag and all of that is, is a legitimate thing. Um, so this is the first normal week that this team really gets, and I think that's going to be very important. And Husker Nation just wants to let out a collective sigh at the start of the fourth quarter if they can see backups coming into the game at the start of the fourth. I think that's what uh, the – Maybe not expectation is for Husker Nation, but that's where you'd feel good about this game is if you can start the fourth quarter and coming into the game is Chubba Purdy or Logan Smothers behind a backup offensive line. If Nebraska can do that tomorrow, I think uh, Husker Nation will be satisfied. But I do like this comment that we got in from Brennan on our Facebook stream. And again, you can check us out on the live stream, ESPN Lincoln's Facebook, ESPN Lincoln on Twitter. And Brennan saying playing loose means not being scared to lose. I, I do like that, Schmidt and uh, there was some of that and during the first half last week. It seemed like this team was not playing to win. They were playing to not lose. Well, the, the urgency part is very true, but there's the balance between having that urgency, trying too hard, and then what if, what if we make a mistake? What if we fail? And you go in tight at half. Uh, talking to a couple of folks, the, the, the mood and, and mindset it, at halftime, you, you can go one of two ways, right? You can – be angry, fire up the troops, come out and rock and roll. Or you uh, can, can let it fester a bit. And last week was an opportunity for some of those leaders in the locker room, guys you hear that, that have embraced that role. There was an opportunity to step up in that locker room last weekend, and I don't know how vocal it was, okay? And, and that's, that's a problem. Now, not piling on, but if you're Garrett Nelson – that's your job, and the way you played in the first half, you're um, you're not going to start rattling cages because you probably aren't real happy with how you played. So, so I get not wanting to be hypocritical, but he's the voice. He's one of the voices, and uh, if if 
history repeats itself where Nebraska's sluggish or struggling, then then somebody needs to step forward and and figure it out. Now, it, it all worked out. Uh, Nebraska has a chance to, to grow and get better. And Nebraska fans right now, they're about over this. Mm. They're about over the last four-plus years. Uh, but there's, there's not a door that's been shut by everyone. There's not a door that's locked uh, or the, or the old, uh, good old uh, hotel room chain has not been, been uh, latched yet. But y- you need to, to figure out a way to, to look dominant, to look Big Ten, and to look put together. The chemistry and gelling part, man, that's a big problem with this football team. Not that they're at each other's throat. It's just that there's not familiarity and they haven't played together. That's, we got to see that step, fellas, where guys that are new to the program know what their job is, their role is, and can go execute. Well, not even guys that are new to the program. There's an offensive line. All these guys have been around the program, and I haven't seen an offensive line that's come together and gelled through the first two weeks of the season. And I know two weeks of the season isn't all that deep into the season, but it is, it is at a point after fall camp where you should be playing as one unit and you should be opening up running lanes against the likes of North Dakota and Georgia Southern. No offense to those two teams, but that's just the simple fact of the matter with you look at Nebraska's recruiting classes, what type of athletes they have here. That, that group needs to gel. Uh, you need to have the gelling between Casey Thompson and your receivers. It was talked about how much these guys were out throwing this offseason, trying to build that chemistry. Well, it's proof that there was chemistry built this offseason, that you can go out against Georgia Southern and get that done. Uh, because simple fact of the matter is you have about two weeks to change the narrative of, of the last four years uh, if you're Scott Frost and, and his staff. You, two weeks. Georgia Southern and Oklahoma. That's about as long as you have to change the narrative. If the narrative is not changed by the end of the game, say 3 o'clock next Saturday after Nebraska plays Oklahoma, it, it, I mean, I don't want to say it's done for Scott Frost. but You still, it, have, in, you still have Indiana, and, and Elijah and Connor, I think 3-1 and one September was the goal. Mm-hmm. I don't know that you get there. I think if you come out of September at 3-2, and two, how did Oklahoma look? What was Indiana like? What's tomorrow look like? I think that's all part of the conversation, part of the consideration. But you're, you're teetering is all, is all I'll say. You'll te- you're teetering if you haven't changed that narrative around what your staff is by the end of Oklahoma week, where you're, you're really riding a razor's edge uh, in terms of, I mean, we talked about hot seat all summer long. The hot seat is very hot right now, and if that narrative is not changed by the end of next week, I, I can't say that Scott Frost is going to have his job past the, the Indiana game just because – We've seen what the last four years looks like, and so far, the first two weeks of the season, this season has not looked much different. Connor, that, that narrative is, is thick, and I, I don't know that it's not heard, but it may be ignored. Guys may be mature enough to just kind of focus on their job because there's a whole boatload of things to do on the to-do list. Well, I want to go back to what you had to say about vocal leadership as well. And we talked about Cranach with this uh, mm-hmm. on, on Saturday morning and the difference between what Northwestern looked like going into the fourth quarter and what Nebraska looked like going into the fourth quarter, right? And I saw a little bit of the same of that against North Dakota. It's a 7-7 ball game. Now, granted, it wasn't 7-7 until the final 30 seconds of the half, but still, you're only up a score against an FCS opponent. And the juice of the sideline was just kind of non-existent. And I think that's got to start with Frost speaking up and saying, hey, come on, like, we got we to gotta get something going here because I, I, I really don't like that low energy that we've seen from this team, and not just this year but in past years when things maybe aren't bouncing their way and they're struggling with a lesser opponent. And I think that needs to start at the top. And, I mean, you go back to what Elijah was saying, and 3-2 and two is probably the goal out of September – I think four and two, if you could get there, would be great. But uh, again, you, you have two weeks to really change the narrative of, of the last four years. And if you can't get it done, there's there's going to be a lot of questions and probably an open seat available at, at the head coach position. Because yeah, if you're through the first four weeks of your fifth season and that narrative still looks the same as it's looked the past three to four years, it, it's in college football, it's pretty much over at that mm-hmm. point. You, you'll, you'll see the writing on the wall if that narrative has not been at least started to be shifted by the end of the Oklahoma game. And I don't want to look too far ahead because Georgia Southern's the next team, and this is where that, that, that reputation can start getting changed. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's kind of the same conversation we had last week where you just got to go in and you got to do what's expected of you tomorrow. That's, that's the only thing you can do to start changing that narrative. Anything short of that is almost expected from Husker Nation. Going to be a big, uh, big opportunity for the defensive line, okay, mm-hmm. 
uh, to, to get some disruption, even though it's going to be more of a quick game for what Georgia Southern wants to do. But how about the corners and safeties? I mean, you've not seen a whole lot of successful rotation. Uh, it's going to be a, a monster day for, for Hill. For, for Tommy, he's got to be locked in. And, and of course, Newsom's been really rock star solid. Your safeties, right? Safety's got to be on point and settled in, and you're going to need to be able to get some rotation there. Hale Varsity Radio is on the road today here in Lincoln at the Single Barrel, the uh, just, a, just a phenomenal steakhouse, and uh, all sorts of whiskeys and beers for you to try. Uh, a great spot inside the Graduate, so you're coming to Lincoln. Guess what? Uh, book a night at the Graduate. Get breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, at, uh, of course, the single barrel. Have you started checking out the menu for how I'm going to pay you up on the steak and a beer bet just yet? Oh, uh, <laughs> we, we got the, uh, the gosh, we, last year, I think Coach Smith and I tried to take it down, Jeff Smith, and uh, it was the, the, the carving board. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it had like three different steaks on it. The guy who can take a steak or two down, Dave Remington, is coming up. Husker, great. Uh, we're here. Uh, hanging out at the Single Barrel. We are presented by Currency. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it. It's Hale Varsity Radio. Live at the Single Barrel. We're presented by Currency. We welcome in College Football Hall of Famer. Uh, the greatest to play it uh, at Nebraska and college football. Many argue Dave Remington is with us. And he's back in town is uh, 1982 being celebrated. Dave, uh, I, I've got to pick your brain on Ireland, man. Uh, you're Mr. Uh, Photog. You do an incredible job with photography around the world. We'll get to football in a minute, but uh, we both, uh, before we jumped on here, we're just talking about the beauty of Ireland and uh, uh-huh. just uh, the scenery. And there, there's a lot of spots you've captured on camera. Ireland's got to rank up there with you, doesn't it? Well, it's a beautiful place. I mean, it's for me, I've, I've looked seriously at living in Ireland at one time, but, uh, you know, the prices have gone through the roof in Dublin, and that's where I was going to look at. But a uh, beautiful place, a lot of places to go. I was the last time, I, it's been about 10 years since mm-hmm. I've been there. I went to uh, Dublin and Cork. Um, you know, it's just a beautiful place. It's a great place to seem to raise a family, and it's just, it was just very nice. Well, it is nice. It's great to spend time with you. How have you been? What else? What, what have you been up to? Uh, things going well? Well, I just got off the desert. I was in uh, Burning Man for, I was in the desert for seven days. <laughs> and uh, so I'm all sunburned. You know, I got that fair English complexion. I'm out there in Burning Man. It, it was fun. I would been in Reno for the last two days, kind of recuperating. And then I flew in last night, uh, for our 40th reunion for the Huskers this weekend. So I'll be here probably till Sunday, Monday. I got to try to get back. I got my band. I'm doing, I was doing a cross country national park tour and I, because of this, yeah, I went down, I was, I, I I mean, it was, it was fantastic, but because of the the, uh, reunion, I flew back from Reno uh, and I'm going to fly uh, uh, flew to, from Reno to Omaha, and I got to fly back to Reno to continue this trip because I got to head back to the East Coast. So uh, I've got another two weeks on the road, it looks mm-hmm. like. So I probably won't be watching too many Husker games, it looks, unfortunately, but other than this Georgia Southern game this week. Well, hey, uh, you're in demand and you're on tour, and I love it. Dave Rivington with us here on Hale Var City Radio. So 40 years. And what do you smile about when we think of and talk about 1982, an incredible team, and you're going to get to be uh, with a number of your buddies yet again and and honored? It's, you know, it's great. What I remember is the players. Uh, I I remember some of the uh, losses. I don't remember too many of the wins. I don't know why, but I always remember the stuff like the Penn State game. Yeah, Uh, We're talking about a 1982 team that was 12-1 and and dominated throughout the year. We had a pick up at uh in, in penn state uh you know some say it was a a, a field that was uh malfunction or something i don't know a referee <laughs> malfunction we had a couple calls uh that were just ridiculous but uh you know you live and learn you just got to keep going man and uh but i'm sure the guys it's going to be great to see everybody uh steve dan kroger and i were captains of that team and then i just felt that i had to come back for this 
uh, even though I was in the middle of something, I said, this is something that is important because these guys meant so much to me back then and meant so much to the state. And we were very successful. Uh, you know, I think in, in my five years at Nebraska, I think we only lost probably six, seven games in that five years. So we were, we were, we were pretty, we're pretty stout and, uh, to see all the guys, and uh, just to tell a few stories and, you know, kind of reminisce on what uh, what happened and see how everybody's doing. It'll be good, you know, because these guys really there's some really quality guys, especially the offensive line that I played with, uh, you know, Mandelko. I know he's a dentist. Uh, Randy Tice is uh, doing very well. I think he's in the in the financial industry. Uh, Glather, you know, Kurt is. I think he's like a superintendent or something in in the school district in Lincoln. So, I mean, all these guys were very solid. Uh, you know, of course, there's the Felices of the world, who's one of my best friends. Uh, you know, and, and uh, so I'm just I'm very happy to see everybody, and it's going to be great to see Coach Osborne again. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's it's going to be a wonderful time. Dave Remington with us here, Hale Varsity Radio, the 40th anniversary in un- reunion of 1982's incredible team. Dave, what do you think of your class? You mentioned five years, and and I look at at that era and guys that you came to school with and then played with, and mm-hmm. I, I look at where Nebraska was phenomenal, still. 10 and two or around that number, but then the jump from, I don't know, top eight, top 10, top 12 to top three. I mean, that's where you guys lived as your class continued to, to move through the years. What, what did your class do what was, do with Nebraska? We had a lot of red, we had a lot of red shirts. We had a lot of uh, Nebraska kids that came on strong in the final years of their, you know, they, they nobody from Nebraska came in looking like they're going to be a superstar, but I'm telling you what, nobody worked as hard as the Nebraska kids because it meant something to us. The 70 teams, you know, that's what that in my mind was like froze me as a Nebraska player or, or a fan mm-hmm. was watching Rich Glover, Jerry Taggy, you know, all those great, great players. Of course, Johnny Rogers, who can forget about him, but uh, fantastic players. And and we fed off that. And it was like, gosh, I want to be as good as those guys and, and, you know, play in a national championship or, you know, have a run at it every year. And uh, I just think that it's a, you know, it's, it's such a different era. They've got portals, they've got Neil, they've got everything else they're fighting except football, you know, and unfortunately that's where we're at. Uh, you know, the pendulum swings both ways. It used, when I was there, if you had took a ham sandwich from the wrong guy, it could be a, you know, you could be, you know, disqualified for the yeah. year. Now they're, now they're giving away the company to the kid. And he hasn't even stepped on the field yet. I mean, it's it's gone. It's totally ridiculous. It'll settle itself out because it has to. I mean, you, this is you know, it's become pro football. Mm-hmm. I hate to say it, but it's become pro football. We just got, you know, we're people are looking for ways to to get people off the portal. Uh, you know, players are threatening to go to the portal if they don't get meal money. I mean, it's just it's a lot different game, and it's got to shake out, and things will shake out. Because if it if it goes like it is, it's going to destroy itself. There's no way this is sustainable. Uh, they're going to have to change, and, and the players got to realize that it, this is not, you know, this is not a deal where you, you go to college to get rich playing football. You go to college to learn something so you can get rich when you're an old man like me. You know, you, you got to you, you have to put your time in. And any people are so impatient now. They're they're grabbing money and doing what they can to you know, take care of themselves, and I understand that. Mm-hmm. But in the same breath, we're the whole uh, the fabric of college football has totally changed, and it's going to have to change back a bit uh, just so they can sustain this. Otherwise, it's going to destroy itself. Dave Remington with us, Hale Varsity Radio, Husker Great. Dave, you just hit on uh, an important topic. One of many, but it it is about paying dues and getting really good at what you're trying to do before you yeah. uh, you expect you expect that, to, to be the boss or start <laughs> that mindset. The problem is the problem is that the impatience. Mm-hmm. We came in knowing as as Nebraska kids that we were going to be here four or five years. We're going to get redshirted and we're going to grow and we're going to work and we're going to grow together and you know and. 
you know, we always had some superstar players come from different places, like Mike Rogier, mm-hmm. Roger Craig. Those guys, they came from different places, came here, and they, you know, they excelled. Uh, their playmakers were coming out from out of state, the best players in the country. We could concentrate on those guys, but it was the backbone of the team was the Nebraska player. The red, the red shirts, the, you know, the walk-ons, guys like that. That's what we need. We need to get to be, uh, you know, put a fence around the state. Don't let our best players go anywhere. They're, we're going to, we're going to get you one. We're, we're going to, we will kneel our, we will kneel the, the walk-ons that we have to, to keep those people in the program. Cause they're the ones that the, the, really the heart and soul of Nebraska has always been the walk-on program. And it's, it's gone. It's, you know, it's trying, everybody's trying to bring it back, but it's so tough when you've got good teams in the Dakotas mm-hmm. in Iowa uh, I mean, there's no bad teams around. Kansas is coming on strong with, you know, with with their coach, with Leipold there. I mean, it's just going to be tougher. So we got to figure out how we can keep our Nebraska players because they have shown that they are some quality players coming out of Nebraska. A lot of them have parked themselves at Iowa City mm-hmm. and done really well there over the years. So we just got to rethink that, get a, get a, build a fence around this state, protect what we have, and then build from there. Dave, uh, topic with this year's team has been the lines of scrimmage, and there's so many new faces, so they've got to gel, right? There's got to be trust. They got to gel, and and they've got to put some time in together. The other part of it is confidence, and speak mm-hmm. speak to to the development and training you went through that gave you and your mates confidence. Well, the thing to about done. playing offensive line, you're not a playmaker. You, you really facilitate the playmakers, and you can't make any mistakes. If you're an offensive lineman, you're a workhorse. You're a guy who is going to – they have to count on. They can't you, – you can't have two good plays and two bad plays. you gotta, you got to be consistent. And the only, only way you be consistent is, is with confidence and with repetition. And then, unfortunately, guys are thrown into the field before they're really ready anymore. And they, they're the conference that gets a story because they're not ready. I mean, if I had to play as a freshman, which they they really almost put me in a few games as it, well, they did put me in a few games as a freshman. But I, I mean, I, my first game, I was out there for five plays and I went the wrong way twice. I mean, it was just because you're, you're not ready for it to handle all the pressure, just running out in the field against Alabama. I was like, Oh my goodness. I never seen so many people in my life. You know, I come from <laughs> South Omaha where you got 2000 people as those and I'm going down to Birmingham and that, and the whole place, I mean, it was just filled bottles getting thrown at you. And I was like, wow, this is, this is something, this is like a, it, it's like a star Wars movie. I'm just looking around just everything but football. You know, I'm like, wow, this place is pretty cool. Look at all this stuff. Because at that time, I think they went from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham. They had to kind of switch off. I don't know why, but that's what they did, probably for recruiting reasons. But, yeah, we were down in Birmingham. I was like, wow, this is nuts. <laughs> they, how were their aims? I mean, did they hit you or were you able to put the helmet on first with the bottles that were flying? Uh, they didn't hit me. I think they've been drinking a little bit too much of that fire water. They were <laughs> they, they were. <laughs> <laughs> aim, aim for the I, middle. I just know Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Sawfield went down and, and they, they go, Dave, you might be in in a few plays. I said, a big, hard gulp. Like, <laughs> oh, shoot, here we go. Uh, but fortunately for me, because I really was not ready, uh, they put Jeff Bloom in and Jeff, Jeff hung in there pretty good for, you know, 225 pound center mm-hmm. back. Even back then, that was real small, but he was a great long sapper, but, you know. Dave Remington with us. Uh, we're here at the Single Barrel Hale Varsity Roadshow Friday. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. Uh, more with Dave Remington. They are celebrating 1982, 40 years, 12 and 1, hosed, robbed, whatever adjective you want to throw in uh, when it comes to uh, that Penn State game. But more with uh, Husker legend Dave Remington on the way. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Hail Varsity Radio. A few more minutes uh, with Dave Remington, Husker, all-time great. We're live here at the Single Barrel. Your hopes for this season here is Oklahoma looms as well. I can't wait for next week, but uh, this week's pretty important too. Georgia Southern's got some dudes that are going to be coming in, and really it's a mentality and confidence topic, a conversation for Saturday night. What do you think they can do this year? What do you think Nebraska can be? Well, like I said, I haven't seen any plays, right. anything. I'm just going to go off the cuff and say, 
No more. They got to improve the line play. It's got to be more consistent. They're going to yeah. get some experience that will come with time. But unfortunately, you know, they've got to win now. Mm-hmm. They've got to win. They, there's no, there's no, you know, a five win season is not going to, it, 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 it's things will change with a five win season. Right. We got to get to six wins. We got to get to a bowl game. And so we just got to start building and just have some small victories. If, you know, on the line, get some, get better play. And, and, and I have all the you know confidence in the world and coach rail will get it done. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, just got to give him time. And we've got pro coming off a serious knee injury. Uh, hope he's doing well. I'll keep an eye on him and see how he's doing. Cause he was one of the bright spots of the offensive line last year, other than Cam Jurgens, who, you know, I, he's, it looks like he's going to be a great pro. And I thought that when I, when we put him on the watch list and people were going, why are you put him on a watch list? I go, this kid can play, and I knew he could. He just needs to get that snapping part done, you know. But he could be a great guard. I'm still thinking that he may be the better guard than a center, but uh, that's you know that'll come down in the future. We'll see. He is killing it in Philly, and they love him. They love him. Oh, yeah. with what well, he's done he's, in preseason, you know, big strong country boy. He's not. He he was he was good. I mean, he would move the line of scrimmage. I would watch that. Unfortunately, you know, a few bobbled snaps and this stuff, you know, that that's the only thing that worried me because he had uh, the, the year before he had some problems mm-hmm. with his fastball, getting it back to the quarterback on the shotgun. And then every time they were in short yarders goal line last year, which you need to be under center, really, if, unless you're trying to fool people, because yeah. uh, you have to, you got to fire off and he, and, and doing that out of the shotgun as a center is, is horrible. Yeah, but but... Uh, uh, he had problems with the, with the, uh, with the snap with his quarterback underneath him. So he must got all that all taken care of, but you could see he had the tools and he might be like Nick Tinglehoff, huh. who a guy who at Nebraska was a pretty good player, a pretty good player. And then he went in the pros and he played like 14 years because he never, he was like an Iron Man, never got hurt. Mm. So, yeah, Tingle we'll Huff, phenomenal. Dave Remington, incredible. He's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. So, Dave, last thought here. I'm going to go to the NFL. And how uh, how do you think Cincinnati follows up uh, last season? Incredible run to the Super Bowl. We talked about that. And uh, they are going to try and go back for some more because, man, they uh, they look potent well, on offense I'm again. So hap- I'm so happy for Cincinnati because they've had a, you know, similar to Nebraska, they had like a 20-year drought of doing – you know, because I think the last time they were pretty good was when we were there in the 80s. I mean, it was it's been a long time. And so they're coming back and uh, we'll see how they follow up. The history is not great with, with Cincinnati. Once they go to a Super Bowl, usually they have a down year this the following year. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I mean, I have, you know, the confidence in the, the team looks really good. I mean, they look pretty stout uh, as long as the quarterback stays healthy. They should be pretty good. Dave Remington. Dave, uh, hope to bump into you in the press box Saturday night. Best to you, and thanks for giving us a few minutes, man. Thank you, Chris. Take care, everyone. We'll see you. Dave Remington with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Good to spend time with Dave as they are honoring 1982. We're here at the Single Barrel, uh, just inside the Graduate. Home Football Fridays were here. Road Fridays were back at the Hale Varsity Club in La Vista, Excited uh, for that, and uh, don't forget, too, if you're up in Omaha, the Go Big Redcast is podcasting up there beginning at 6. Wonderful food and drink specials just off of Giles in La Vista with the Hale Varsity Club. That is Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt, Connor Clark in the green room. The pride of Fairbury, Bill Dolman, uh, will join us, and uh, we'll get into the topic of well, the Boo Birds that came out, and it's NIL now, fellas, right? It's NIL. Guys are getting apartments and Jeeps and sometimes apartments and Jeeps. And <laughs> uh, you had a clap back, guys, uh, from some of the players this week. Totally get it. The criticism uh, has not been good. Players will hear that. How do you handle it's the question. Uh, Nebraska needs to handle it the uh, the right way for a lot of Nebraska fans, but what's your guys' take? You're the same age, both of you, as a lot of these guys, and and technically they're not professional, but they're they're not <laughs> they're not amateurs anymore either. I think you're kind of a scumbag if you're throwing insults at kids uh, at, at any age, uh, unless it's my kid and he beaned you, uh, or you're beaned your kid. I I would understand that. That's a little bit of a joke, but. It's it's different because everyone's got radar or rabbit ears rather, and 
you're you're hearing the noise too from the fans. You're feeling it. I would think it was more the the coaching than than the the play uh, before half last week. But that's something that uh, Nebraska players really haven't faced a lot in their time. Well, that, that's a part of coming to Nebraska, though. I mean, with the NIL era, I think it opens up this a little bit more right or wrong, simply for the fact that you came to Nebraska t- to be on a stage, to be somebody who could get these NIL opportunities. And while I'm, I'm not a fan of people hopping on Twitter and, and calling guys out by name and saying this guy's A lot guy's of terrible. film experts that are going off on the OI the last three days. But at the same time, if you have a, a legitimate gripe with how a guy is playing, I mean, that's this is what the NIL era has become, where, as you said, you're not a professional, but you're not an amateur anymore either. Uh, so... The, the, the hate out of nowhere, the, the hate for no reason, that I, I can't stand. But if you have a, a legitimate gripe with a player or a position group and, and you want to hop on Twitter and talk about it, I mean, Nebraska fans are, are the biggest stakeholder in the football program. There would be no football program without Husker fans, and uh, you wouldn't be getting these top 25 type recruiting classes without the fan base of Nebraska and, and without the NIL, which is the new era of college football. So mm-hmm. there's a weird middle ground there where, where you can't be as critical as you can be with an NFL player, in my opinion, but you're moving closer and closer that direction. I don't want to say it depends on how much NIL money you make, but these players kind of. But but these players came to Nebraska for a reason. They came to Nebraska to be somewhere where you could get attention and you could be on the big stage. So you've almost opened yourself up for criticism simply by coming to Nebraska. God, or it's a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and you too, Elijah. Where you know what you, you love the passion, you love the fan base, uh, you love the support, but. You don't want to get a reputation either, Connor, of that fan base that's going to annihilate um, uh, an incoming prospect. Yeah, I, it takes a lot for me personally to boo at a team that I root for and that I like. And uh, Twitter's one thing because, you know, people can go on Twitter and say all they want all day long. And, and that's something that you can block out as a player, too. You don't have to look at Twitter, right? I'm not a huge fan of the booing. And I think you bring up a good point with the reputation thing. Because obviously Nebraska is known for the brand, for the fan base, for the sellout streak, etc. But you don't want to put that negative connotation on the fan base. I get it. The results have not been where they need to be. And I think the boos were mainly directed at coaching staff, which I understand. Two but timeouts, yes. For, for, <laughs> for me, it takes a lot for me to boo at the team I'm rooting for, especially the school that I go to. Um, so for me, I'm not a huge fan of it. The Twitter thing is different because you can just block that out pretty easily. Uh, but o- overall, I'm not a huge fan. And, and you know what? People have complained about the booing from the fans, but I kind of go in an opposite direction. It's easy to, to be the fan base that doesn't boo, and you call yourself the greatest fans in college football because of that whenever you have 40 years of dominance. Booing is caring. I- exactly. Boo- booing is, <laughs> in, in, in today's sense, yes, booing is caring. And booing is saying, you know what? To take me and my family to this game, it now costs me two, $300 I'm, I'm paying to the university. And if, if it's not a product on the field that I appreciate and that I want to go see, this is how I voice my displeasure. And I, I don't like the booing, but it can be warranted. Well, you should have hammered the, the 30 and a half point spread too and, and <laughs> offset that, that family financial cost. That's uh, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt, Connor Clark, Hale Varsity winding down hour one. We're here at the single barrel and we are presented by Currency. And now, and now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Hale Varsity Radio Roadshow Friday. We're here at the Single Barrel and uh, incredible steaks. Over 200 whiskeys to choose from. You may need some before the game tomorrow. You might need some after the game tomorrow. And uh, we invite you down inside the graduate. Uh, Some emails to get to on the whole topic of booing, yay or nay, when it comes to You as a Nebraska fan, are you in a different mind frame because of the NIL era? Pete's with us as he's dialed us up. Pete, go ahead. How are you doing today? We're good, man. We're uh, smelling great steaks. Uh, There are worse Mm -hmm. places to be. Well, I guess I wouldn't boo myself. Um, But the reason why people boo is, you know, everything we've been told for four years, we've done the opposite. Where we're going to be a physical running team and and we're going to get back to the old nebraska ways and our line was going to be like the old nebraska lines and we put up with special teams for four years that was horrific it boils down to what we're been told for the last four plus years what we see on the field is the opposite and now over time frustration builds up and the only voice they have is to boo or not come to the game 
Mm-hmm. And people are kind of tired of it because they don't see any change on the field. And and that's the way they can express themselves to have some impact, I believe. Pete, good take, man. Appreciate the phone call. And, yeah, I mean, the, the, the fan base is not abandoned coming yet. There's still some seats just for you, the Nebraska fan for Indiana. You know, you, and Oklahoma is going to be elbow to elbow because it is boomer. And then you've got a lot of question marks. Pete, good stuff. Thanks for the phone call. Kent emailed in Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Phone lines to get in touch with us again at 466-3776 or 800-825-5865. Kent emails and says, so is a 7-7, seven and seven, so so a 7-7 seven and seven game at, at uh, Nebraska at half versus an FCS team is non-booable. Uh, it is 100% booable. And, you know, there's just some decisions that went into that, i.e. the timeouts. You, you touched on that in the reaction show last weekend. But, yeah, people are, are sick and tired of being sick and tired. They're, they're fed up. They're frustrated. And they want to see physical dominance. They want to see clean football. You've seen a little bit more clean football, but there's been some turnovers still. So let's see if, if Nebraska snaps out of it through another week of practice. And how many times can you remember, Schmitty, that the home fans booing Nebraska? I think of Oklahoma State in 2006, maybe? Uh, yeah, it was 2007, and Gundy and Gun, it was 38 nothing at halftime. Yep, I remember that one distinctly. And, and that got uh, the Smiley Jones popped. So that the 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 uh, silver lining was Steve Peterson was removed shortly after that. I think that Nebraska abomination. the Nebraska then, Ohio State game circa 2017. 2017. Yeah, because you know the team wanted to turn around and run back into the tunnel, mm-hmm. but the gates were locked. <laughs> that was the, that was the year Ohio State. It was like their second straight year without punting against well, Nebraska. And, no, it was, and then and old Joe Burrow got in for three touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And the other the like the first time I heard him booing like was. Like, Towards Scott Frost, mm-hmm. they booed the uh, the heck out of the guy against Central Florida at uh, at halftime. We are presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. We have uh, Bill Dolman, the pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports. The professor is on deck. Uh, Scott is in. He has caught all the fish in Minnesota, and now he's drinking all the rumple mints here in. Single barrel. It's a bold choice for for 4:50 p.m. I will it's, say it's a great choice. <laughs> he can have it. <laughs> Dolman on the way. Cedric Golden. His thoughts on Casey Thompson, and uh, of course the matchup with Bama, Texas next hour. It's Hale Varsity here at the Single Barrel. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back with you, it's Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity on the road. It's single barrel. We're getting geared up for Nebraska, Georgia Southern. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark, the pride of Fairbury, the professor Bill Dolman <laughs> is, uh, is, well, he's commandeered the computer as uh, we are presented by your friends at Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Numbers to get in, 466 3776 800 Eight two five five eight six five. You can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Billy D, I mean, I like the shirt, man. This is good. I made it in uh, shop class. Of course you did. It's one of the things that, you know, I'm teaching over at the university is uh, textiles. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and what, 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 well, what type of uh, Nebraska textiles, my favorite Nebra- uh, textile shop, but there's NIL money to be had in textiles. <laughs> Isn't there? By the way, should I should I um yeah, you know, mess up with the illusion here that I'm actually no, over this way? No. You just didn't three, want to sit that close yeah, to me. You three called guys me. in a camera shop might be uh, camera shop might be uncomfortable. That's a movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh <laughs> what are you looking at me like that? Is that, for? Is that a movie? It could be. <laughs> <laughs> Connor Connor's like, what do you, what okay, Connor's hollering at me. Oh, we got Tim on the line. Tim, I miss Tim. Tim's going to talk about my wife and Rolexes. So, uh, I think so. Tim, welcome in to Hale Varsity. Hey, guys. 
thanks for taking my call. Hey, you know, I, I, I understand why some of the fans um, may feel they, they have the right to boo. Um, you know, for years I've, I've kind of been wondering where this football program has been going. Um, I think it was because initially when we hired Scott, we thought we were going to see a change. I think we thought right off the bat we'll get to a bowl game. And then we thought by this time we would be competing, you know, most likely not only for just our division title, but but also for possibly a conference title. We're obviously not there yet. Um, But, you know, the the one thing I've always wondered about Nebraska fans, and you guys can kind of answer this question, um, where do we draw the line as far as are we diehard fans or are we just – are, are we over, over the line, you know? Um, down in the SEC, guys, I, I, I think what, what we, you're seeing from, from Nebraska fans would probably fit in there. And maybe as Nebraska fans, we, we try to hold ourselves to, to, a, to a higher class of standard, and we don't want to see our fans do that. Um, we all want this to work. Um, this this, this puzzle is going to play itself out um, one way or another. Um, I, I, I really want Scott to succeed um, but but answer that question, guys. Where do you think draws the line? Um, I'm curious. Thanks, guys. Hey, Tim, appreciate the phone call, man. Thanks for listening. Listen, I, I think it's it, it's hard to broad brush it and say you're evil and horrible if you do X, Y, and Z, but it, it's individualistic. As a collective, I think Nebraska fans are amazingly classy. I think they're patient. But I think what allows Nebraska fans, I don't want to say a pass, But what allows Nebraska fans uh, a little bit more leeway with reaction, specifically negative reaction, is because of the knowledge of the investment and they know what good or bad football looks like. They know what a soft defensive line or offensive line looks like. They know what uh, a bulletproof interior looks like they know what effort looks like they know what intelligence looks like and they know absolutely what fabulous coaching looks like sometimes you just get beat and if you get beat by a better team it happens and uh, they're the same fans that stand up and say damn it ricky williams we're not happy with you but we're going to give you a standing o for breaking off 204 on uncle charlie that's the nebraska fan base it's the same fan base that is going to cheer a Noah Vedrill if he fumbles at the four-yard line and then runs the Indiana ball player down to at least try and force him to a field goal, the effort. And that that's the fan base. So if Nebraska fans lose it, it may be directed at a player, but overall it's directed at the experience they've been, they've been dealing with the last four to five years, and I think Tim made a good point. Listen, it's not Psychoville, Finkel's the mayor, SEC land. Nebraska is not even close to that. Is Nebraska entitled and uh, short-sighted? No, I don't think so. I think, I think you've been very patient. Hell, you've been patient for 20 years. Right? You haven't won a conference title. So it's boiling. It's bubbling. And Pete kind of kicked it off with this isn't what we were supposed to see. And I think he speaks for a lot of fans that way. But uh, there's a few that will veer off, right, the 1%, 2%, 3% that will – that'll lose it. But I don't think that was Bill Dolman. I'm going to bring you in on this. You too, Elijah. You too, Connor. I don't think it was directed at the kids last week as much as why the hell are you calling timeouts and they score uh, on, on fourth and goal. It, it was performance related. See, I was at the game and I didn't hear booing. I heard people on the stand saying, uh, we wish that we had a lead guys. We wish you had played better, but we'll look forward to seeing you in the second half. That's what I heard. But maybe there was maybe there were people booing and were a little more upset than that. Because the Champions Cup can only hold so many. <laughs> Gosh darn it! I wish we weren't tied and had a lead on North Dakota. I heard people yelling that too. No, look, it's it is 20 years of frustration. And Tim brings up a really good point. When Scott got hired in what was it 2017 and the 2018 season. There was such a collective euphoria in this state because Scott's name had been on their lips for, well, 20-plus years when he played, but also as his career as a football coach started to grow and his name started to become more prominent at Oregon. And then what he did at Central Florida, people are thinking, this is the guy. We always knew it, and now he's back. And And this misery that we've been going through for the most part, some of them were successful seasons, but some of them were just 
angst-ridden seasons where it just was not being done. And people may not want to hear it the Nebraska way. Wasn't playing well. There wasn't a lot of character. There was just, it just seemed so disjointed. And it seemed like this was going to be the moment that things were going to turn around. And yes, got some, some things with some bravado. But this is going to be the moment things turn around. And then it didn't happen. And then the loss in Colorado, you know, the Colorado loss in, in his second game. It Both just, of them. It, right. But it was like, I always wonder, what would have happened if they had gotten to play that game against Akron? Just they, gotten that game out they, of the way, gotten a win, had feel-good momentum going into Colorado. Played all, They were so jacked, so sky high. They made some bad mistakes in that game, and they lose it. And it's, it's been stumbling down the road ever since then, right? So I agree. Yeah, Nebraska fans were expecting something quicker. We still expect it to turn around. We have hopes that it will turn around. But 7-7 against North Dakota, people were just frustrated. I don't think it was directed at any one player in particular. I think it was collective. This is just not acceptable. I brought up the game, and you mentioned it a moment ago. When Nebraska played Texas here and had won 40-some games in a row, and what was that, 1999? 1998. 1998. Great game. Texas was better. 27 24 Down Nebraska at night. team, but a, but a, but a, right. but a tough Nebraska team. A tough team, a team year but better, away and a better Texas team. team. Nebraska played well. People thought that was a great football game. We came up short against a rival, and people thought, you know what? That's Nebraska kind of football. And I remember a game, what was it, Southern Miss or somebody who won 7-3 in the Callahan era or whatever it was. And people were like, this, this is awful. They lost to Southern Miss. But, they, but there was a game that they won. It was like 7-3. Pitt. Pitt, you're right. And people are like, this is not the way you play. It was a win. <laughs> but people recognize it. They know effort, and they're with you with good effort, win or lose. I honestly believe that. And, and simply put, uh, I think Husker fans just know what the, the Nebraska standard is. They, they want a team that represents the values of this state. Hardworking, they do things the right way, and at the end of the day, they win. And, and I think Husker fans can live for a couple years if they don't get the win. But I think back to the Bo Pelini years, and Bo Pelini, he, he didn't get fired because he was going 10-2. and two. He, he was getting fired because those two or three losses every single year were on the biggest stage in embarrassing he ways. Got, and he got fired because he scared the hell out of the athletic director when he walked in the building. Well, that too. but like, There were like, no lights on, and he hit under the desk. He, <laughs> he didn't embody that Nebraska standard, and I think that's why Nebraska went for that, that reactionary it, hire of Mike Riley, Nebraska nice, quote-unquote. It didn't embody the state. Grandpa Worthers. But, <laughs> but, but I, I, I look at the, the program here with, with Nebraska under Scott Frost. Do they – represent the state of Nebraska and what Nebraska values in a football team? I don't think so. And I think that's why you hear these boos at halftime because it's these years of frustration of seeing a program that doesn't embody the Nebraska way. Physical, smart, fundamental football. They're not seeing that and they're growing frustrated because the results that we have been promised over four or five years now are not coming to fruition. Connor, uh, jump in here, brother. You're uh, you're the Chicagoan and uh, you look at Nebraska and uh, you've been a sports fan a long time. So there's this perception of Nebraska being what from from your worldview, sports view, mm. and and what what is it now that you've been here about a year and a half, two years? Can't remember your grades depend on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well, you're, you're putting there. me on the spot with a with a co JMC faculty member on the, on the screen. You can't be doing that to me. Did we lose Connor? No, but, we got him. Okay, he's just frozen on um, solo style. From from an outsider's perspective, before coming here, I mean, you always knew about Nebraska, a prominent program in the '90s, and the history was you, you couldn't ignore it, right? And coming from a guy who grew up watching Northwestern football, it was like Northwestern. Okay, their history is '95, right, in the Rose Bowl, and that's mm-hmm. about it. And then they start kind of building that, but you always knew about Nebraska, and then coming here. I mean, I thought I knew about Nebraska and Chicago and coming here and then like, whoa, like big, big difference. And obviously the standard is really, really high. And I know, Bill, you mentioned that, OK, what if what if they play the Akron game in year one of Scott Frost? I have a different question to pose to you. What if they win the Colorado game in 2019 when they had the 17 point lead? Do you think much changes there? Big time. Yeah, I, I think if there's some wins like that, this, the first game, the second game, uh, some key moments in the, this stretch of, what, uh, seven losses by one score, even if you win two or three of those, I think there's a different vibe in terms of what's been going on in the program. Beating Colorado, rival or not, 
17 point lead yeah i think that was probably a turning point for the worse uh when it happened and they some games they just don't recover from uh, last year i don't think they recovered from the loss against michigan state no. because of the way they lost it and then you got you know questions and confidence about what what, what happened why did we do that um so i think that you can look at games here and there not the 30 losses in totality but a few here a few there that have had detrimental uh, effects on this football team and its mentality and its ability to win and its belief that it it can win and so yeah that would probably be one of those games that i would circle and say if only if only things would probably be a little bit different let me say this though it may be just one stat in one game but I think the 189 yards that Anthony Grant put up in the North Dakota game, and I know it's North Dakota, but for Husker fans of certain generations, when you see a Nebraska running back getting that amount of carries and that amount of yards, it harkens you back to the thrilling days of yesteryear where you just remember those games where you had somebody who was going to rush for 150, 180, 254. And it, it, I think it gave people... A memory of the past that they can kind of hold on to that maybe the run game could be okay this year. The other thing that I think is what's wearing on Nebraska fans is the the beyond the seven to seven at halftime guys is judgment, and and you're at that point in this tenure, and many of you are past it with your ruling on the head coach's judgment, and then it was <laughs> it was a salt block in the wound with the onside kick. All right, and we get to judgment when it comes to timeouts before half, trying to get a two-minute drill going, but you you didn't get off the field. I mean, it's complimentary football. But your judgment with your buddies that you brought with you from Central Florida, and I love loyalty, love, love, love loyalty to a point. And you get a two-year extension from the Moose, you keep your guys around, you had a chance to make all of these hires that you brought in now in 2019, in 2020. And finally, Treb comes in and you have a talk after the start you had last year. And then finally, you're forced to make a move. And it could have been done. And now it feels a bit too late because you've got a staff that maybe you really believe in. But, man, uh, the, the, um, the, the timeline here goes back way too far. To, to, to warrant a, a sixth season. And, and with this, the resources and the fan support Nebraska has, I don't think it's an unreal, unrealistic expectation for Husker fans to expect a top 20 coaching staff in the nation. And Nebraska had the number one coaching staff in the nation for 20 plus years. You got the resources, man. And you you, got ha- you money have the to resources burn. to have a top 20 coaching staff. And simply put, the, the coaching staff that has been here over the past couple of years has not looked top 20 in the country, hasn't looked top 40 in the country. And I'd be hard pressed to say it looked top 60 in the country. Another point to players. I, again, I don't think Nebraska fans were directing their ire at halftime at individual players. I think you're right. Judgment comes down to it to a certain extent and maybe the whole extent. But if you're a player and you want to play at the highest level in the best atmospheres, sometimes you're going to take a little bit of heat. Mm-hmm. But that's a, it's a lot more important, I think, to play where people care, like they care at Nebraska and care throughout the week as opposed to playing in a, in a stadium where you can hear an empty bottle of schnapps get tipped over and nobody cares. <laughs> the scream. Nobody very shows breaks. up. It's a very like good what point. North, you were in Dublin. What, Northwestern had like three media there? And it was a blurb in the Tribune I after the game was over? You I, know, know, I know where you, I was at. There was way more than three media, but it was everyone was in the hallways because there was free booze. <laughs> <laughs> so. but, but you know what I'm saying is you come to Nebraska, there's, there, there's certain expectations that the fans are going to support you and that they're going to come out and watch you play, and they're going to respect you. And I think Nebraska fans do respect the players that they have. All right, we're going to keep this conversation going. It'll morph into George. Speaking of Dublin. Yeah, uh, (laughs) Bill Dolman with a Guinness. Shocker. Uh, We're here at the single barrel inside the graduate. We'll keep talking Nebraska booing expectations. Where are you as a fan, as a fan, 466-3776 more here from the single barrel. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Hail Varsity Radio Roadshow. Friday, we're here at the single barrel. We're presented by Currency 
Are you wanting to see Nebraska, Oklahoma? Do you want to check out Husker Volleyball? How about College World Series? Or Dave Matthews that's going to be in Omaha in November. Where do you go for the tickets? You go to Red Zone Tickets. Real easy. They are locally owned. They are out of Omaha and they are a thousand percent reliable for you. A local source, local is better. Red Zone Tickets, redzonetickets.com, and a A plus better business rating. So you want to be there. You want to be there for the College World Series come summertime. You want to be there for Nebraska football when they lock horns with Oklahoma for the first time since 2009 in Memorial Stadium. You want to go see Dave Matthews, man. Seen Dave about 15 times. And uh, can't wait to see him again. Come on, Michigan, 11 a.m. kickoff. That's all I'm saying. But uh, redzonetickets.com is where you go. A 100% guarantee on all orders. You'll receive authentic tickets and experiences you'll never forget. And that's what it's all about, man, is the experience with mom, dad, brother, son, daughter. It's uh, so important. And live events make it the best when it comes to that bucket list and creating memories that last a lifetime. Visit redzonetickets.com today. Redzonetickets.com out of Omaha. Go see them today. And and, and a quick personal story here. Just a quick personal note. I I know that feeling of buying a a ticket from a a weird site that you've never heard of before. You don't trust this as well. We 100% refund it if you get non-authentic tickets. And I go, I don't want a refund. I I want authentic tickets. And uh, these are promise to be authentic tickets because they're they're great folks i I was nervous walking in that oklahoma game last year because everyone else had tickets that didn't look like mine with the qr codes and i went okay i'm nervous here and luckily i got in but i know that feeling of standing in line being like man i hope these tickets are real because uh, i plan this trip down to oklahoma and i don't want to get in i bought my my notre dame tickets in south bend from some dirty hippie in a grateful (laughs) dead shirt and they said regent on us like i hope they work they did but i was really unsure but yeah that that feeling is just it's the worst that was a notre dame regent they ended up being <laughs> no. Well, I don't know, but but they were they were the Regent section of of uh, Touchdown Jesus. So we saw Crouch run in right in front of us. Oh, nice. Well, I need a couple of volleyball tickets, so I might have to test them out. Yeah, uh, RedZoneTickets.com. Connor, you got an email from uh, from Ben. Go ahead and uh, chime in on that for me. It was it was from Pete. He called in over the break, and he also wanted to mention about the comments about no one-on-one tackling drills being held in practice and the product being seen on the field and that the, the, you know the comments for the coaching staff is that they, they would feel bad if a player obviously got hurt in the drill which is a fair point as mm-hmm. Pete said but he, he says that the fan base could be upset about a comment such as that because you're seeing a lot of missed tackles in the game oh, okay I got a problem with this mm-hmm. We don't have one-on-ones or whatever tackling other people in practice, but does that mean that somebody can't get hurt if they get, get hit by a number two or a number three or a scout team player? Or did not LSU lose its number one defensive tackle the other night against He's Florida State going when he hopped over a guy on the field and blows out his ACL? I get so tired when I hear, and this is not an indictment of the Nebraska coaching staff, but you hear this all around that we're not going to have one-on-ones in practice because, well, we don't want anybody to get hurt. Okay, so that's saying that your backup guys aren't tough enough to hurt your quarterback or anybody else that they might hit in practice. It it doesn't make any sense. It's football. You have a chance to get hurt. Duriel Harris, for the Miami Dolphins, about 40 years ago, spikes a ball in the end zone and blows out his ACL. All right? It happens. People get hurt in football in a variety of ways. But if the number ones aren't going to go against each other and have full-on full contact in practice because they're afraid somebody's going to get hurt, so we're just going to have them go against the twos, does that mean your twos aren't very good and they hit like powder puffs? Yes. It, 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 means, your, it, it means your twos are, are way slower <laughs> than your ones, and it translates to game speed of, oh, crap. Uh, we can't catch up with the Northwestern. Okay, back, or, so you're telling oh, no, your number twos, not. you're telling your number twos, or your number threes, or your backup guys, Ernest Hausman, okay, second career game is starting for Nebraska. His first game was in Dublin as a backup. But let's say he's not going full speed in practice or doesn't hit very hard because he doesn't want to hurt anybody. But Ernie, you're starting this week, okay? You got to go smack Bird around. 
you can't just, I, it's full speed or nothing to me. On Friday walk through, I get, okay, we're going to walk it it's, through. Maybe it's, it's on page. It's but if you tell Okay, but if you tell Ernest Hausman for the first three weeks in, of August, don't hit anybody that's in a, in a starting uh, spot because they might get hurt, then what's he going to be like when he gets his chance to start in the second game he's, of the year of his collegiate career? And he's going to miss tackles. Yeah, it, the, oh, it's, you're telling the guy, hey, I know the last time you went and tackled somebody guy full speed was when you were playing Lincoln North Star, but here, go out and play <laughs> Northwestern now. I'm with you on that. And, and, it's football. And, Hit. And I know it's not. Okay, we do it. You can't do the Oklahoma drill anymore. <laughs> All right, man's fine. Game, huh? You okay. change the name. Okay, we can't do that, and we can't have defensive coaches with a two-by-four and a rusty nail on the end of it. <laughs> God but it's Chuck. football. People are going to get hurt in a variety of ways, and if that's full-on full, one against one in practice, that's just the way it is, okay? I, Aaron Rodgers is a commodity making $50 million a year. Don't hit him on Thursday. Fine. But if you don't have contact in practice in August and September – you're going to have sloppy play, missed tackles from now until the first part of October. It's just going to be symptomatic. But to say that nobody's going to get hurt in practice, well, then you just got a bunch of candy asses on the second team. All right? That just does not make sense that you can't it, it hit. It goes back, fellas, it goes back to the bigger picture of why you're booing. It goes back to the bigger picture of why you're losing one-score games. It goes back to the bigger picture of Northwestern lining up and going Nebraska on you comes back to development and conditioning. And, and, it, and, it, and it comes down to are you either bringing in kids that can come in and play right away at a high level or do you got to develop? Nebraska's always had to develop with a few exceptions, and, and that's been an issue, and that's been an ongoing issue post bow quite frankly, is, is the development phase. And with all this conversation, I do wonder, is this a coaching staff that is – so untrustworthy of their backups and of their depth that they're unwilling to go out and get guys hurt in this sense? Is that where, where the issue stems from? Or is it, you know, well, the NFL? I mean, that's what we heard about the, the Mike Riley years was, well, it's more of an NFL-type practice. Well, NFL players have earned the right to You're go 75% You're a professional. You can't make a tackle, you get cut, right? Exactly. You, you've earned the right by making it to the NFL to get those 75% practices before you, you turn around and play on Sunday. But in college, you need that development. And, I mean, have we seen development? I, I think... Off the top of my head, sort only, of. only a couple positions where we really see development. The tight end position is one where the, we've seen great development over the past couple years. Uh, the secondary, I, I think we've seen good development over the past couple years. But outside of that, I, I haven't seen real great development at any of the positions. Offensive line, definitely not. Mm-hmm. Wide receivers, definitely not. Running back, obviously not because everyone leaves. your number one guy is, is a JUCO transfer who's been here for six months now. Uh, defensive line, you saw development but now you have a, a whole new group of guys in this year i haven't seen much development of those guys the development has been lacking throughout the entirety of the husker football program and, and that uh not an indictment of the players i think it's an indictment of, of how they're training these guys because mm-hmm. we've seen them make strides in the way you they come out they're the all bus team they look like they should be a great football team but they're not great football players the one guy that has been recruited by the frost era that that has been developed has been garrett nelson most of, most of the other guys were inherited from the Riley era or recruited during the Riley era and were, were very well developed by, by the coaching staff, the, the super seniors last year, JoJo and Stilly and, and some of those guys. I think Reimer's an example. Reimer's is another guy that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, and, and then Austin Allen, but Austin, again, was a Riley recruit. So it, it's... it's it's tough, but Nebraska needs to figure it out because everyone else in the Big Ten has. They, they look, you do the eyeball test, fellas, they, they look right now as the softest, softest offensive and defensive line. We've seen Indiana on TV. We've seen Illinois. We've seen Northwestern. For God's sake, we've seen Michigan. We even saw Ohio State. <laughs> Ohio State roll their sleeves up and get physical, get dirty uh, last week to get a win against the Irish. Nebraska's got a long ways to go. It's not over. It's not that it can't be done, but it's better start tomorrow about 6.30. I don't want to take away your point because I've been a big Garrett Nelson fan since he put his name on the dotted line. You know that. I said he's you the most said. important recruit in the Scott Frost era before he even stepped on campus to play. Was Garrett Nelson developed by a dad who was a wrestler? There is a <laughs> discipline to be an All-America wrestler 
And his dad certainly had it when he was at Nebraska. He's also ass kicker tough growing out in western Nebraska. That's right. just the way you are. There's, he's a homegrown Husker. That's the way you're brought up. You got to work so for it. Inherent advantages. So it's inherent. It's inherited by his family, but it's also inherent in the culture that he had out there, and he brought that with him to Lincoln. And there's a story. Who, I don't remember who his roommate was. Uh, like day one when they arrived on campus for fall camp or whatever it was, and and Garrett gets his, all of his stuff moved in and looks at his roommate and says, "Hey, you want to go work out?" It's like I just moved in. He goes, "So let's go work out." You know, that's but that's his mentality. And fortunately for Nebraska and Scott Frost and Eric Chenander. They have a guy like Garrett Nelson to be a team captain, and uh, and he has been worth every bit of ink that he put on the dotted line, and whatever somebody is making sure that he's doing quite well with NIL. Email in from Greg. You can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com or here at the Single Barrel. We'll get to the Friday forecast coming up. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark, the Pride of Fairbury, Bill Dolman here. Vic also weighing in. We'll get some of his comments in a moment. But uh, Greg says, I'm fine with booing players for the big bucks people who pay to see the game, like Elijah said, this year already feels like Riley's last year mm-hmm. and uh, dead man walking is, you just don't have a lot of faith, you don't have a lot of hope and, and I'm not quite there yet because I think I believe that, that you can, can get it flipped around, you can, you can find a way it's not impossible, this isn't or they're not playing the 95 Huskers uh, two weeks from tomorrow you gotta get better you got to change your ways from a practice standpoint, and and you've got some players, you've got some dudes. Uh, it's 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 part of it's between the years, and part of it's allowing them to just go raise hell physically uh, during the week. Clay Helton had an incredible quote during practice this week with what he does to his team to get them ready. It sounded a lot like uh, he was a 1990s Husker talking with what it takes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, when it comes to just that physical, the, the grueling, the conditioning, and then the the battering that goes on. Well, Clay Helton is the son of a coach. Kim Helton was uh, the head coach at the University of Houston when I was down there. I actually hosted his coach's show for a couple of years. So he knows what he's, he's a football lifer. He knows what it takes for a good team to be better and when they have to practice hard or not. We're live here at the Single Barrel. We'll get into the Friday forecast. Coming up, more thoughts on Nebraska and uh, what the Frost era has been. Hail Varsity continues. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a caught pre-teen Swedish boy. Back with you. We're here at the Single Barrel. It's Hale Varsity Radio Roadshow Friday, home football Fridays. We're here at the Single Barrel inside the Graduate down in the Haymarket. Reminder, if you're up in Omaha and you want to hit to the Hale Varsity Club, uh, do so. Great spots for you Friday before high school football. Bell West and Omaha West Side. Get it rocking tonight. And uh, the Go Big Redcast uh, podcasters with her at. Uh, going to be there at 6. So stop by, see a live show, live music as well tonight at the Hale Varsity Club in Omaha, uh, just off Giles Road in La Vista. Great food and drink specials there. And we're going to be uh, hunkered down in Omaha for those Road Fridays. Excited for that. Vic has chimed in. Uh, Vic uh, has gone nuclear, and I love it. Vic says, <laughs> you know what? It means don't be tied at half with an <laughs> FCS team. And uh, the nickname, you are the Oracle of the Single Barrel, Bill Dolman. You and your guests. Uh, hey, Vic, I love being here. You know, I know the Hale Varsity Club up there in Omaha is nice. But this We're place. We're going to kidnap you and you, take you You some know, time. I came down here a year ago and, and, and did a, a couple shows with you. And Gun I'm telling points. you, I'm telling you what, the food here, one of the top five steaks I have ever had in my life. And I grew up in the great state of Nebraska, God's country. And I'm telling you, the food here is phenomenal. They got Guinness, and they have other things that I know you like to imbibe in. So this Breakfast is a burrito. this is a awesome. great place to be, and I am happy to be here on a Friday. Connor, you were saying something. Dolman was was backhanding me. Go ahead. The, the breakfast burrito there too is oh, yeah. very very good. My go to choice. Really, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know they had a breakfast burrito. Right, right breakfast seven a.m. every day. Wow, it okay. is money. It is money. We'll be here uh, for the weekend edition three to five tomorrow. So we're, uh, we're all set up. 
But uh, guys, I think I think we're fierce rivals uh, about that time of the day. But never mind. Your phone isn't going to work. About <laughs> we're kind of part of the family. We're just Christopher Moltisanti <laughs> when, when it comes to the family. <laughs> All right, that's, that's about, a, about as good of a the comparison as I can give. You. Uh, Christopher Moltisanti with the family, guys. So long and short, this will lead us into the forecast. It is uh, kind of put up or shut up, and it's a a reality uh, that it is lying in the sand time for Nebraska tomorrow with their performance. I mean, if I'm paying $60 for parking in downtown Lincoln tomorrow, you better put up a good performance against Georgia Southern. That's as simple as that. You're not going to Georgia Southern and paying $60 for parking there. You're not paying $60 for parking at North Dakota. You're paying $60 for parking around here, and I want this football team to show me there's a reason why I got to pay $60 for this primetime event parking. Rather just get up a little earlier and find a meter. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm... But the, um, the, the point is duly noted with uh, inflation. Uh, f- Nebraska football will truly let us know about whether inflation's here to stay or not. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let's get into the forecast. So here's the reality. Clausburn again stopped at the border swallowing a balloon. So he'll be with us for Oklahoma week, and that'll be okay. Uh, so Bill Dolman going to step in uh, for part of the forecast. And uh, Connor will get you geared up. Elijah, get ready. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Nebraska and uh, where they're thinking here. The line for the Big Red is tw- 23 and a half over under. Is that right? Okay. Uh, 23 and a half over under. We'll get there in a minute. Tennessee minus six against Pitt. I found my my sheet. Thank God. Tennessee minus six versus Pitt. Connor, where are you at here? Are you buying Pitt or do you like uh, Rocky Top? I think Tennessee covers. I think they win by a touchdown. I'm going to go 35-28. I think Rocky Top wins. Okay, Elijah, where are we at? It's hard to say. Tennessee's a team that played, I think, Ball State last week. And, yeah, they beat them pretty good. But I'm not fully sold on Tennessee yet. So uh, I will take Tennessee to win because Vegas is pretty good about that. But I'm going to have this uh, close game, 35-31. Tennessee gets the win, but no cover. You know, I I am going to go with Tennessee as well. And why I'm going there is just as much respect as as I have for Pitt and what they've done. Narduzzi's a a crybaby. Mm. I really I want him to get housed. I mean, just just get crushed and shut up, dude. You're, you're a 10-win team. You should be happy. But it's always someone else's fault. It will, it will be your defense's fault tomorrow. Give me Tennessee 35 and uh, Pitt 28, a, a narrow cover for Tennessee. Florida looked great. Great uh, opportunistic defense, but more so their quarterback. Incredible as uh, the Gators minus 6.5. Kentucky comes in under the stoops. Uh, ranked 20th, uh, your only really great ranked game tomorrow because uh, there's a little shakeup with BYU and, and Baylor's wideouts. I like Florida to keep on rolling. I think that six and a half is a little high. I think Florida won't be flat or won't disrespect Kentucky, but I do think uh, it's a serious issue with just trying to bounce back and play two really good opponents consecutively. Give me Florida to hang on 31 to uh, 28 over Kentucky. Elijah? Uh, I'm with you on the fact that, I mean, the Swamp's a tough place to go play. I'm not 100% sold in this Florida team yet. If I was a betting man, I would stay the hell away from this one. Uh, but I will take Florida to win, and uh, six and a half sounds close, so I'll give Florida a six-point win, 34 to 28. The Gators get it done. Connor, what do you got? The Swamp is a tough p- place to play, as Elijah just mentioned. I think this is going to be a close game. I don't know if there's going to be a hangover from Florida for winning that first game of the year against Utah. I have them winning by a field goal. I think Florida gets it done 27-24. I skipped the pride of Fairbury, Tennessee, Pitt, Kentucky, Florida. What do you got? I like Mark Whipple's offense and Kenny Pickett and uh, Jordan <laughs> Madison. Um, I think that uh, Pitt's got it going on. No, I'm with you. I'm a little tired of Pat Narduzzi, and I think Tennessee, uh, being an SEC team, probably has a lot of pride on the line. I like uh, I like Tennessee to cover. Iowa, Iowa State, the battle for the big green. Track. Do I get to do Florida, Kentucky? Going to skip me on that one? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm jumping ahead. I'm looking at the. Clock. I'm not quite sure why Florida has so has gotten so much attention this week. 
I know they beat Utah, who was ranked number seven, but it was week one. They got a quarterback. I, I know. I understand that, but it, it was like it was like, oh my time. gosh, they, this is the Florida's the Buffalo Bills of college football. I don't. They, they they barely eked out a win. Okay, and Utah's pretty good. Nevertheless, I think Florida's going to cover over Kentucky. Okay. Uh, we're going to squeeze in Iowa, Iowa State. Low scoring. Give me the Cyclones. Give me the points. Two and a half. Iowa's favorite. I like Coach Campbell getting it done. Elijah. This line has moved late now to Iowa. Three and a half point okay. favorite. Uh, which makes me think the Hawkeyes get it done. Give me 20 to 14 in Iowa victory. How many defensive scores? One? Uh, probably one. All right. Connor? I like the Cyclones in this game. Iowa's offense is just horrible after game one. I think that the Cyclones win a really, really close game, maybe even less than a field goal, uh, but I do think they, they cut into that that three-and-a-half point spread. You, you guys are overreacting on Iowa's offense. They played a good South Dakota State defense. I still don't think they're a they good offense. They didn't score a touchdown. Wrong, but you're overreacting. <laughs> That's an overreaction. They Come didn't on. score a touchdown. <laughs> they had two safeties. Uh-huh. Bill Dolman says what on Iowa, Iowa State? I think Iowa learned a lot last week on how to beat Team 7-3, and I think they beat Iowa State 7-3. <laughs> Look at that. That's we will have the point. Nebraska Wait, pick. Is, we'll is, that, have is the that Nebraska. touchdown, though? No, it doesn't matter how it gets done. I, Seven looks one way, but it could be done another. It could be done another. Uh, we'll have the Nebraska thoughts. Uh, the uh, forecast continues. Bama, Texas, that number is uh, also out there. We will have a take. As we wrap up Hour 2 and a Friday road show at the Single Barrel here inside the Graduate with Hale Varsity Radio. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HaleVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. We have a woman screaming outside, and she is all sorts of Georgia, Georgia Southern happy. Clay Helton is about 15 feet from us, a really bad option pitch in the desert of Arizona once upon a time. We are presented here by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. We resume the Friday forecast here. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark, Pride of Fairbury, NBC Sports, the professor, Bill Dolman. <laughs> Okay, there's two uh, either Baylor or BYU wideout suspended. But you know what? This is the worst football game ever. Because (laughs) Baylor doesn't drink. BYU (laughs) doesn't drink. There's no booze within a 500-mile radius of this game. So so you're saying there will not be a a franchise of the single barrel in Provo opening anytime soon? They are opening the whiskey closet right now behind us here at the single barrel. I think there's a personal bottle for us in there somewhere. You can keep dreaming. (laughs) Uh, Minus three BYU. Uh, Baylor dogged. I don't know much about BYU. I like BYU. I like what they built, and we talk about getting old, staying old. BYU is old. Give me the Cougs, 27-21, the win and the cover, Elijah. Dude, I don't know anything about either of these two teams. So I'm just make it up. Yet. I haven't seen either of their games. I'm going to make it up, and I'm going to go, oh, BYU falling 31-21. to 21. Baylor gets it done. Connor, what do you got? What's the spread on this game? Isn't Baylor the underdog? They are. B- BYU's minus three. Yep. I think Baylor Given gets, the three. I think Baylor gets that done. I, I think Baylor okay. being the underdog is, is a little absurd. What happened? Any like it's, is, it's is the fans trouble, still though. screaming out there? We had We had people got I'll go I'll go with, I'll go find her. Okay. Bill, what do you got? I like Baylor in that game to win on the road. I think BYU's gonna be way too hyped up. So I, I like Baylor winning that one uh, 31-30. We gotta get to Nebraska and Georgia Southern. We'll sneak in Bama, Texas and Two minutes, allegedly. Uh, Nebraska wins. They don't cover. It's better, but still not good. And Nebraska wins 38-24. What do you got? Well, it has been a, a tough fr- uh, tough week for our friends across the pond. So in honor of the queen who lived to be 96 and served 70 years, Nebraska 96, Georgia Southern 70. Okay. Uh, that's a vote of confidence for the Black Shirts by Bill Dolman. Cover in the overs. Uh, Elijah, what do you got? Well, first off, there, I'm hearing reports of a live eagle outside on a man's That's what's arm. screaming? I, I, don't, I think there's something else a woman. Or is it pecking the man? That's what everyone was gawking at through the windows was there was 
a live eagle on a man's arm. But uh, we're talking Nebraska here, correct? Nebraska needs a live chicken. Go for it. Uh, I'll take Nebraska <laughs> big. With the weather tomorrow, I think that's going to mean bad things for Georgia Southern's offense. So give me Nebraska getting it done 38-10. to 10. I actually think they get a big win this week. Connor, what do you got? I think the rain causes Nebraska not to cover, actually. There's going to be a lot of running the ball, but I think they win it 31-10. <laughs> to 10. Sorry, Elijah. Georgia Southern goes back to the option. <laughs> it <laughs> runs for five bills. Okay, uh, yay or nay, uh, Texas, Bama, Bama cover the 20, yes or no? Oh, big time. 42-17, to 17, Bama gets it done. 50-3, to 3, Saban says no more. Uh, what do you got, Connor? I think Bama covers that spread. I don't know the score, but they cover. Bill? I think Nick Saban sends a fish in the Austin American <laughs> Statesman to Jimbo Fisher by what he does to his former assistant, Steve Sarkeesian. I think they will cover, and they will win 62-14 to 14 in Austin, and Jimbo Fisher will have a, a message sent to him that way. That's pretty good. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for spending time. Thanks for coming by. To the single barrel, we're presented by Currency Hale Varsity Roadshow Friday. Back here at 3 tomorrow. Come see us here ahead of kickoff, Nebraska, Georgia Southern. Take care, and we'll talk to you manana or tomorrow afternoon with Hale Varsity.